Welcome to the Block Time Podcast, produced by Riot Platforms, where we take a deep dive into Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining, energy, the grid, and any other interesting topics that we find along the way. Uh, on the previous episode, uh, where we left off, I believe we discussed that uh, we needed to discuss the ETF, the Bitcoin ETFs. Um, multiple were uh, finally approved by the SEC. And so we've got about a little more than a week's worth of trading, um, and we can kind of look at some of the, the trends that have been happening there as well. Before we do that, though, uh, I wanted to rewind back a couple of episodes when we had Michelle on to talk about Riot Rookies, our uh, summer internship program. The job descriptions are now live, uh, so if you have any college-age friends or daughter, son, or uh, acquaintances uh, who are interested in finding their way into the Bitcoin mining industry. This is a great way to get their foot in the door, an internship at Riot, one of the leading Bitcoin miners. And um, so go on, uh, send them the LinkedIn uh, page for the company. We've got, I believe, eight or 10 uh, internship roles across lots of different departments. So I think that there's something for everyone uh, there from electrical engineering to uh, HR to everything in between. So we even have an intern position to help me out. Oh, excellent. Yes. Come <laughs> intern for producer Gabe. <laughs> so multimedia production assistance is needed. Yes. Um, and uh, we, we promise we won't just ask you to fetch the coffee. Oh, that's uh, absolutely not what happens on the internship program. No, you know. no, everybody gets to really play a, a real good role into um, helping out the company. So, yeah, that's right. Uh, and there's lots of interesting production work uh, to, to be done. Um, so uh, go go apply. Um, and uh, yeah, that's I think that that, that covers that. That yeah. that covers that. Yeah, lots uh, of like different positions within the company. Everything like you said, from HR to uh, operations and, all, and everything in between. So and different locales as well. So there's, oh yeah, for sure. Uh, roles in California, here in Austin, um, and I, I well, think that's it. Yeah, there might be something in Rockdale. We'll Rockdale, yep. yeah, of course. Yeah, I consider Rockdale to be part of Greater Austin. <laughs> sure. Yeah, not too far away. Uh, the Hill Country, uh, although it's not very hilly over there. Not so much. No. All right. I'll have to think of a word. Central Texas. Correct. Central Texas. That works. So yeah, we're looking forward yeah. to everyone putting in their applications for the internship program. Um, you know, it's a it's a great time. You'll enjoy it. Yep, and you'll get to do uh, Bitcoin one hundred and one uh, with me, and you can ask me lots of Bitcoin questions. Not that you need to be an intern at Riot to ask me Bitcoin questions. <laughs> I, I I'm always happy to answer, uh, even from uh, pseudonymous people on Twitter. I pick up their questions. Um, okay, so uh, Bitcoin ETF. I think that. There was a lot of hype around this. People got really excited. Um, when when it initially happened, I think the Bitcoin price pumped quite a bit. Uh, and since then, price has backed off somewhat. So uh, it's it's interesting to kind of dig into the details of, of what went down. But this story goes back much further than 2023. Let's rewind to 2013. Uh, the Winklevoss twins... The Winklevi, as they're sometimes called in Latin, <laughs> uh, uh, who are well known because, uh, first of all, they they kind of had a story with Mark Zuckerberg and the founding of Facebook at Harvard, and apparently there was some, uh, you know, uh, tensions there, or acrimony or debates, uh, and they ended up settling uh, with Facebook with Mark Zuckerberg. I think it was for $100 million, um, a large large chunk of change. Uh, so great way to start off life, come out of college with $100 million uh, because somebody else started a successful website. <laughs> okay, I uh, won't get into it. Uh, now, they were savvy. They did not go and spend uh, their $100 million on um, rowing, which I believe is their passion. Uh, instead, they uh, invested it into Bitcoin. Um, after hearing about Bitcoin while I believe they were on a trip to Ibiza. It's like a... It's Ibiza. Ibiza. <laughs> a, a famous clubbing location in Europe. 
uh, where you learn about investment opportunities, apparently. Um, so they, they went into Bitcoin. Um, and so they obviously did really well from that. Uh, they also uh, have started some Bitcoin-related ventures. So they started uh, Gemini, um, which is like an exchange brokerage. But they also, um, they wanted to start their own ETF. And so they filed an ETF application very early, I believe in 2014, um, that was rejected by the SEC. And for a decade, from that filing until this month in 2024, January 2024, the SEC said no to every spot ETF filing that was not a futures. So we can discuss the difference between those two. With a traditional spot ETF for a commodity like Bitcoin, or we'll get into that controversy as well because so, there's a lot of weird some legal semantics around uh, because Bitcoin's just like this software. It's, it's yeah, not, not something physical, tangible that yeah. you can hold. Yeah. So there's lots of debate as to what it category fits into because it kind of creates a new category and people don't like creating new categories for things, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, they kind of want to shoehorn it into uh, existing categories. In any case, um, it got shoehorned into the commodity category. BTC did. So if we look at other commodity ETFs, um, they, when a, a spot ETF will actually go and buy that physical commodity, put it in a warehouse, and then issue shares that say, hey, look, if you have this share of our gold ETF, that means that you've got an ounce of gold here in our vault, uh, and it is what it is. A futures ETF will try to replicate the price movements of the commodity, of its value, right, its purchasing power, uh, by trading futures on a futures exchange. Um, and so the advantage there is that they don't have to have a physical vault. Right? They don't have to hold the actual commodity. Uh, the disadvantage is that there are transaction costs associated with trading futures that mean that there's higher fees on a ETF vehicle like that. So the SEC did approve a, ETF, a futures ETF for Bitcoin approximately two years ago, I believe, uh, but it has not been very popular because of the expenses associated with that. Now, in parallel to the ETF application process with the SEC, uh, Barry Silbert and his um, Grayscale uh, vehicle uh, created what's called a, a trust, um, and so this is the GBTC trust, which is a bit of a way of um, sidestepping the ETF application process, and uh, the cost of sidestepping it means that um, it, people can buy the shares in this trust, uh, but they cannot convert those shares into actual Bitcoin. Um, and so there's no redeemability, which so apparently that was fine for the SEC. And um, w what ended up happening with GBTC is that it traded at a premium for a while. Uh, so the value of the shares of GPTC was greater than the actual Bitcoin being held by the trust. So it was not a futures product. It was actual Bitcoin being held by the trust. And the shares were trading at a premium. And so you had all these smart money hedge funds come along and borrow in order to create more shares and sell those shares at a premium relative to the spot. Um that worked until it didn't. Uh, eventually, the shares started trading at a discount relative to uh, the spot value, and um, it got really bad. Uh, it went from you know uh, being I, th I think it was at a five to ten percent premium to a fifty percent discount at the bottom of the bear market, and that put tremendous stress on a lot of players in the financial ecosystem that kind of spawned on top of uh, Bitcoin. Um, and it really created, I believe, a lot of damage for uh, investors. Presumably, the SEC exists to protect investors. I think in this case, um, due to their own actions, due to their positions that they've taken on the ETF applications for the past decade, they created tremendous harm uh, to investors. And um, we can 
look at some of the reasons they gave for denying ETF applications for 10 years. But at the end of the day, I think that um, it was arbitrary and capricious. And the court uh, is actually what ended up, the, you know, the we've got three branches of government in the U.S. So the SEC is part of the executive branch. The judicial branch seems to be what kind of pushed the SEC and forced them into approving the spot ETFs uh, because there was not really a valid reason to deny them. So that's um, that's kind of the overall background. Uh, I know that it's a lot of context, but uh, it, it I think it speaks to the fact that there's been a lot of excitement that's built up over 10 years. Yeah, I mean, 10 years to, to approve an ETF, it seems like a long time. But then when you think of the grand scale of Bitcoin, I mean, it hasn't even been, been around that. I mean, you know, much longer than that. 15 years for Bitcoin, yeah. Right. T- t- 10 years waiting for this application. Um, Do you think and it was very small at the time, too, right, 10 years yeah. ago. Do you think that the SEC was waiting for Bitcoin to kind of make its mark as whether it's not going to stay around? Perhaps. I think that there is, um, and Gary Gensler, in the uh, blog post that he wrote about being forced to (laughs) approve the ETFs, uh, he was very transparent about the fact that uh, he just doesn't think that uh, Bitcoin has value. And the, you know, but he also prefaced that with, hey, we're not a merit regulator, meaning that you can you can get listed, uh, you you know, you can have an IPO and the SEC is not interested in figuring out whether, OK, are people going to buy Tesla cars or not? Right. Like they're not trying to make a determination of whether it's a good investment or not. Right. In this case, the, they, you know, he's starting with saying, well, we're not biased, but. We don't think this is a great investment. Well, I mean, then that's an opinion, right? Yeah, which means that you're biased. Like, let's just be honest about it. Um, And it didn't fit into um, their worldview. And it's not exclusive to the SEC. I think that even Warren Buffett at Berkshire Hathaway also has this perspective that Bitcoin itself is not a productive asset in the sense that it does not generate a cash flow because it is cash. And so cash does not generate cash flow. You know, if you hold a hundred dollar bill, it does not. But from their perspective, only the government should be allowed to issue cash, mm-hmm. and that uh, any kind of private sector or uh, non-government uh, cash is uh, not legitimate or invalid somehow. Um, but reality disagrees with them because Bitcoin has grown like gangbusters. Uh, over this entire period of them being skeptical about the intrinsic value of Bitcoin. Yeah, I think that for me, I see it more that the people who are so closely tied to the printing machine don't want to see an alternative. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, And so they kind of um, now, but it, it raises the question of, well, why is that not the case at the judiciary level or at the legislative level as well, right? Because Congress has actually been pretty hands-off with Bitcoin. Um, and, and so I think that part of it, too, is how responsive are they to the voters and how close are they to the printing press? Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, executive branch, I think, is very close to the printing press because the Federal Reserve is essentially part of the executive branch, right? The president appoints the chair of the Federal Reserve. Um, furthermore, you know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau gets its funding from the Federal Reserve. Uh, the SEC, I think the SEC, um, is, uh, kind of, uh, uh, more ideological almost, I want to say, uh, than, than, um, but they're also following orders from others who are skeptical of Bitcoin, uh, in some regard. And so... Uh, we've heard rumors that Senator Elizabeth Warren has been heavily involved in who gets appointed to financial regulatory bodies. And so if you kind of want to advance your career, you probably want to align your ethos with uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren's. Um, whereas uh, on the judicial side, I don't think that there's so much influence from Senator Elizabeth Warren on who gets appointed to be a, a judge, for example. Um, so, yes, uh, the the consequence though is that uh, since the SEC or sorry since the ETFs have started trading, 
um, it, people have been scratching their heads of what's going on because the Bitcoin price has gone down. We, everyone, myself included, thought, hey, it's just going to go up because people are going to buy Bitcoin, to, mm-hmm. you know, it's part of their portfolio. Um, and there was just a lot of pent up demand to sell GBTC. People did not want to sell at a discount, right? Why sell at a 50% discount if you think that the ETFs are going to get approved and that pretty soon you're going to be at, at, um, uh, par uh, at 100%. So if somebody bought GBTC at a 50% discount, they doubled their money in BTC terms, Correct. in addition to increased dollar value of the Bitcoin. So I think that there was a lot of folks who are like relieved that they can finally sell this uh, ETF uh, or this GBTC thing mm-hmm. that they didn't want that they were forced to hold. For they were just time. holding for too long and didn't really need it or want it, I guess. Yeah, they yeah. needed to rebalance their portfolio. Mm-hmm. They wanted to do it a long time ago. And so you've got all of this pent-up demand to sell that is offsetting a lot of pent-up demand to buy. And so then you just get disappointing price action in between. Right. I mean, relatively speaking, the price didn't drop astronomically. It's just, no. you know, a little blip. We're still about 40 k uh, we had had a very strong run, so arguably we were already overbought. Right. Uh, so it made sense to uh, see this pullback. And the other interesting part of it, too, is that the net flows are inflows into the ETFs. And so what we may be seeing is that GBTC had a very high fee structure. So I think it's like 1.5%. These new ETFs that got approved are at like 0.2%. So we're seeing people sell GBTC to buy other ETFs that have lower fees. Um, and that's that works well in a retirement account. In a non-retirement account, if you sell GBTC, that's a taxable event. Uh, and so some folks are still trapped in this high-fee product uh, because of the tax code. And so that is harming investors as well. Um, and uh, that's, that, that's a negative. So... Um, all, all that said, I think that um, it's interesting from the Bitcoiner perspective. A lot of Bitcoiners, um, they don't like ETFs because it means that uh, essentially somebody else is holding your own keys. And one of the core principles of Bitcoin's freedom is not your keys, not your Bitcoin. So technically, when, when you hold an ETF, you're holding an IOU. They're promising that, hey, we'll give you Bitcoin at some point in the future, uh, or this will track the price of Bitcoin. But you're not actually getting the private keys to the Bitcoin. So the purists, the maxis, you know, like myself. <laughs> uh, won't be w- buying ETF? Won't, won't, uh, won't be buying an ETF. Um, although, this is where I, I provide the counter argument. Devil's advocate here. Um, there, there's a convenience factor for folks who are just dip- dipping their toes into Bitcoin. Uh, they're not all that familiar with how to self-custody. And so... Um, they are anxious to have price exposure to Bitcoin because they're very bullish, uh, but they're nervous about holding their own keys and they need to learn more about that and they need to experiment with it more before they can put their life savings on it. And so I think it makes sense in that scenario to say, all right, well, just hold the ETF, learn more about custody, self-custody, get yourself a hardware wallet, Put 20 bucks on it, right, uh, worth of Bitcoin, and and experiment with it before, uh, and then that way you're you're good on both sides. But, yeah. I think you make a good point that, you know, the ETF is helping push adoption to those who don't necessarily understand fully what Bitcoin's utility is or how it works. But, again, pushing adoption to where everyone can get their toes wet into the Bitcoin space. Yeah, and uh, I, I hear a lot of people say, like, that they're interested in Bitcoin, they'd like to have some, but they don't know where to get started. Mm. And so this perhaps provides kind of, okay, this is the beginner mode. And then as you go to intermediate and advanced, uh, you'll be able to figure that out. The one thing I'll say to that is there is a plethora of YouTube videos and channels dedicated to Bitcoin 101. And I mean, Pierre, I'm sure we've put out some stuff yeah. that could be related to a Bitcoin 101 that really explains what the the basics of mining is of holding your own wallet what a um you know a, a pass key is or, you know so yeah just education i think is, is readily available for those who do want to learn agree agree um it's 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 still a learning curve uh even with all the resources out there uh and the other thing too is uh, in terms of access 
folks are really used to just logging onto their brokerage account, looking up whatever asset they're looking to buy. You know, even like they could buy an ETF that's like, oh, this is for a foreign country, right? Uh, here, you can buy the Argentinian stock market as an ETF. And so they, they like that level of convenience. And so mm -hmm. to them, it's not so much like they and, and it's also it comes down to subjective risk management. They might perceive the risk of their brokerage account being seized by the government as very low. Uh, and so to them, it's like, well, they're not interested in the private key management aspect of Bitcoin's value. They like that it's an option, that it's available to them. Uh, but it's not the option that they're going to exercise. And um, I think we have to respect that. Um, the other thing is that from a Bitcoiner perspective, uh, we cannot stop ETF issuers from participating on the Bitcoin network. So if an ETF issuer wants to create private keys, run a node, and you know participate on the Bitcoin network, part of Bitcoin's freedom is that we don't get to decide how people use it, uh, which, you know, we, we can have our best practices, we can educate, but at the end of the day, people are going to use Bitcoin however they want to use it. That's part of the value proposition here is that they do have that freedom. Um, and, and then also there are investors who are investing on behalf of others. So, for example, a pension fund uh, it is probably not within their mandate and not within their operational capabilities to have a enterprise grade multi-sig. And so they're going to want to find a solution that is going to work for them. And an ETF might be a great way to do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, that is really cool to diversify those types of portfolios like that and add BTC to that portfolio, pension portfolio. And the pension world is really in dire straits right now because everyone is retiring, not enough people are contributing into the pensions, and so you have this funding gap develop. The only way out of that funding gap is to have above average returns. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to get above average returns by just buying, uh, you know, bonds. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think the, a Bitcoin ETF is a great way to help meet the the demands of uh you know of portfolios uh from the pension perspective and so fingers crossed uh folks will be open-minded there would that fall into the aggressive plan category well it depends <laughs> on your allocation right so if you're going a hundred percent into bitcoin or worse yet leveraging up going a thousand percent into bitcoin then that's aggressive perhaps too aggressive <laughs> But if you're saying, okay, hey, we're going to put a 5% position on and, you know, Bitcoin does a 10x, well, now that's a sizable percentage of your portfolio and perhaps you've helped someone retire. You'll retire happy, yeah. Yeah, or your pensioners will. Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, but, um, yeah, I, I, you know, if the, the nice thing about the, you know, the SEC waiting 10 years, there's 10 years of price history. And so if you're trying to model a portfolio, you have to take that into account. You can't just be like, well, I don't like Bitcoin, so I'm not going to look at the data. Like that's unprofessional. Like you have to look at the data and uh, kind of come to a determination there that, yeah, it's volatile, but a, a pension is not looking at what is the price year to year. They're looking at what's the price decade to Decades. decade. So I think it meets kind of their, their time horizon. Uh, but I'll let the professionals work that out. But uh, I think the ETF is a great tool uh, that they now have at their disposal. And so I think that's why folks were super bullish about, hey, once an ETF gets approved, these big money managers are going to be piling in. And so we're going to see. But I, I see it as planting a seed, right? Uh, yes, it's going to grow and be a giant tree. Uh, but uh, let it sprout. Let it grow organically, uh, and uh, the results will come. I like that analogy. Yeah. It's a good one. I also use the tree analogy for Bitcoin's volatility because people will say, oh, you know, aren't you scared of, like, Bitcoin, you know, being so volatile? And it's like if you go and look at a tree when it's really windy and the branches are moving very quickly, you could be scared that the tree is going to fall over unless you can see the root system underneath and then once you see the root system underneath it, that might be bigger than the tree above ground, then you're like, okay, there's no way this thing's moving. Uh, it's not falling over. An even better analogy. Yeah. You just love trees, Pierre. I do. I do. Yeah. <laughs> well, I came, I came up with it while I was staring out the window of, you know, and thinking about Bitcoin's volatility. 
Um, because in in the in the metaphor, uh, the roots are the software engineering fundamentals of Bitcoin that people don't see. Right? People don't see the code. They don't see the the node software. They don't even see the you know our facility out in Rockdale. Um, they what they see is the price chart, and that's moving around a lot. But everything else is very very stable underneath. Stable underneath. Yeah. I mean, which is to Bitcoin's credit, and that's what it's all about, right? Is having um, an immovable. You yeah. Know, what, what would you call it? Code, right? Yeah, and it's it's the people that are volatile. Correct. Uh, that layer on top of these these traders who are you know, fomoing in and out. Humans being humans. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that you know we'll we'll uh, we'll see the GBTC situation continue to uh, improve. Um, I think that if they were smart, they would lower their fees. But maybe I'm the dumb one because if not a lot of people are moving out of that vehicle because of the taxes then maybe they just continue to gouge the public <laughs> until the tax code changes. Uh, so what do you think is the next step in that in that sort of space, in, in Wall Street space towards Bitcoin? I, I think that um, the, the next steps, uh, so other than just inflows, right, which and I think we'll see steady inflows and in that um, we're going to have that tailwind going into the halving on a continued basis. Even if week to week, yes, the price will go up and down, I think – Month to month, even year to year, uh, we've got institutions stacking sats and accumulating Bitcoin at a large scale. Um, now, at a technical level, it's really interesting because the SEC said, yeah, sure, you can have your ETF, but we're not going to allow you to send Bitcoin into the ETF directly. You have to do a cash create. So you have to send fiat and then convert the fiat into Bitcoin. Um, and, uh, same thing on the redemption, right? You can't just sell the ETF in return for BTC. You have to sell the ETF for dollars. Um, I think that the next step is getting through that, the in-kind versus cash redemption. Um, I think that it will make these products a lot more efficient and they'll be able to further lower the fees. Um, the other thing is that the fees are... Um, largely a product of the custody fee. So a lot of these ETFs are using Coinbase as their custodian. And that's great because Coinbase has a lot of experience doing Bitcoin custody. Uh, they've been doing it for more than a decade now, and they have a great track record. Um, so does Kraken, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> my former employer. Um, and so they're, th th they're charging the ETFs for this custody service, and then the ETFs are passing that cost along to uh, investors. Um, what we could see emerge is that more and more ETF issuers will self-custody. Uh, and already Fidelity is self-custodying as well. And that might give them an advantage in terms of pricing the fees to where they can actually outcompete um, the others. And also, they'll be in a better position to enable these in-kind uh, redemptions because they'll have all those operations in-house. Um, so I, I, I imagine a world, and it, it was funny to see the reactions to this tweet. Uh, I tweeted out that we'll see a Bitcoin ETF where you'll be able to actually like send from a Bitcoin ETF to a Lightning address or to a, a real Bitcoin address um, just from your brokerage account. Just like you can, uh, a lot of brokerage accounts, you can send uh, a wire transfer or an ACH or you know, write a check. Some of them even have debit cards. Um, so you can actually send payments from a brokerage account that might be, you know, earning a high yield or in this case, be invested in Bitcoin. So you'll be able to uh, spend your Bitcoin or add to your Bitcoin uh, in a very seamless manner uh, in the future. And so That's super interesting. Yeah, we'll see a tighter, tighter integration uh, between the Bitcoin network and kind of the traditional financial network, which I think is what the SEC and others who are like-minded, they don't want that. Like they, they want these worlds to be separate, but that separation is actually inefficient because you're just, you're creating like an arbitrary barrier that people then have to walk around. Um, but if we make it really seamless, uh, then yeah, it'll create more consumer choice and more competition and competition is good. Uh, it'll drive down costs. Uh, and I think that, uh, it, we, the other thing that we want to see is that, or 
not that we want to see this, but that uh, will be a natural outcome is that, um, you know, broadly speaking, uh, international investors do continue to see the United States as the best jurisdiction to invest in. Um, and, uh, you know, because of the property rights, because of the judicial process here is more transparent, uh, more fair than other jurisdictions. And so what we could see is that international investors want to use U.S. ETF, Bitcoin ETF products, rather than um, whole, even holding BTC abroad or even having like foreign ETF. Uh, and we've seen like European ETFs develop around Bitcoin quite a bit um, because of this delay from the SEC that it's created opportunities in other jurisdictions to have these products. Um, but we'll see that, uh, I think, come back to the U.S., and if the SEC gets out of the way, then we'll see more and more innovation here in the U.S., um, which Britt leads me to a next point, which is kind of a, a policy discussion. And I, I hope that we'll, we'll have Brian and Sam on to, to discuss this. But I think that the um, SEC is in need of fundamental transformation and reform. Uh, and so I think that um, there is... Uh, Currently, some proposed bills uh, that that would help reform that institution so that it can be its its best self, uh, rather than kind of being the cranky old man who says no to everything. Uh, you know, let's be a little more dynamic, uh, forward thinking. Um, and uh, I think that 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 will happen, whether it's under this administration or or uh, a future uh, iteration of. An administration. I don't know how to word that. It's whether Biden gets reelected or not, uh, uh, or somebody else gets elected, I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay, so um, the SEC, I think, is is on a path of of losing. Not only did they lose on this ETF uh, story, but I think that they're also losing on the broader crypto cases, which. As a Bitcoiner, I don't really care about uh, whether XRP is a security or not. But in any case, they are losing there. Um, and so there's there's reform needed uh, for the securities laws uh, at large. Um, yeah, I, th I think that. I think that covers the it. SEC? Yeah. Um, the ETF? ETF. Um, oh, uh, the other part of the ETF, which I'm really excited about, is the marketing. Uh, so... Uh, because every ETF issuer wants to attract investors, now they have an incentive to put out videos and uh, tweets, social media, all of this, uh, TV advertisements, AM, FM, radio advertisements saying, you know, just like there's advertisements for like gold, right? Uh, now there's going to be advertisements for Bitcoin everywhere. They're saying, hey, Bitcoin's a great investment. Look at our ETF. Um, which I think is 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 great for the ETFs, but it's also just great for Bitcoin. That we have all this positive uh, energy going into. Hey, I love marketing. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it works, right? It works. Uh, hopefully, these ETF issuers don't uh, poach uh, our talent uh, from the Bitcoin mining world. Um, but uh, yeah, if if you've issued an ETF, if you're in our audience. Um, you're welcome to come on the Blog Time podcast and and shill your product. Uh, uh, I've got some contacts. I'll see if uh, if they want to come on. Uh, I think that would be fun. Um, and so that marketing is good. Um, the BlackRock ETF had a video uh, that got really rave reviews from uh, from the Bloomberg ETF analysts because it was, um, as some characterized it, a boomer video. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one you showed me the other day, right? Yeah, it was just, yeah. Uh, you know, ex explaining things. You had a lot of positive stuff to say about that one, didn't you, Pierre? Oh, sorry, you're thinking about a different one. Oh, I'm thinking about a different one. Yeah, now, there, now there's several. I think that maybe what we need to do for a podcast episode is um, we'll we'll uh, do a, um, a review reviews, reviews, right? Yeah. Out, of, out of 10, how many points did they score? For accuracy, uh, you know, entertainment purpose, you know. Vibes, uh, yeah, yeah, vibes. yeah, audience. Uh, That's yes. fun. Yeah, we could possibly do that. That would be fun. Um, and so th these these videos, I think they're, they're going to add fuel to the fire, right, of, okay, now people don't just hear about Bitcoin because it's volatile from the price. They don't just hear about Bitcoin because somebody's trying to add some FUD about swimming pools of water being evaporated or... Uh, you know, the CO2 emissions um, or lack thereof or uh, 
uh, criminals and terrorists, you know, all this false information that has been spewed. Now we're going to get really positive information about, hey, it's scarce, 21 million Bitcoin, you know, um, and uh, that's that's going to be coming through to to uh, those audiences in a way that has never happened before. Um, and I think that not only will it help drive the price of Bitcoin, the purchasing power, um, but it also help improve the public policy and kind of the perception of Bitcoin that, all right, now the brand is is cleaned up a little bit. Um, some of the Bitcoin purists say, oh, Wall Street is co-opting Bitcoin. I think that's false because ultimately Wall Street can join as a Bitcoin node, right? Every firm can run its Bitcoin node and join the network, but they can't change the rules of the network. No matter how much in Bitcoin they own, they still can't change the rules of the Bitcoin network. And I, I like that a lot. Um, and so uh, I, I, I disagree with that perspective. I think that the opposite is going to happen. I think that uh, Bitcoin is going to cypherpunk Wall Street. I think Bitcoin is um, changing Wall Street uh, in ways that were uh, uh, and in that the are, early days of. Yeah. yeah. Uh, rather than vice versa. Uh, you don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you. That's been a saying in the community for a while now. So uh, Wall Street's going to find out what that means. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so that's that's it on the ETF side of things. Um, and um, I think that the the other news item was more on the political side, which is that um, Donald Trump, who's kind of the leading uh, in, leading in the Republican primary at this point, according to the polls. Um, and according to the results from the uh, Iowa caucus, uh, he, he, he won handily there. Um, and we saw um, Vivek, uh, one of his competitors, drop out of the race after that uh, and endorse Trump. And Vivek said that um, behind the, not behind closed doors, behind the scenes, behind uh, you know the podium, uh, well, he, he talked with Trump about uh, some of the policy positions that he thinks are really important for for Trump to to pick up on, um, and to kind of continue Vivek's campaign, uh, you know, or kind of, um, yes, fold that in. One is criticism of central bank digital currencies, and so CBDCs have become a really important issue, uh, especially kind of on the populist right. About hey, these are a tool for the government to control everyone. And, um, you know, people will say, oh, that's just paranoia. But is it really paranoia? Because we have case studies. We have case studies. One, a case study in uh, communist China, where they uh, are able to control the population using, uh, you know, the currency uh, and everyone's payment information and kind of taking all that information and then applying a social credit score. So if you're buying cigarettes, like, that means that it's going to be harder for you to move to a particular neighborhood or, you know, like uh, just kind of Orwellian type stuff. Um, or if you if you buy gasoline, well, now you're not, you know, uh, green and your CO2 emissions are bad and now you're not allowed to vote. Right. So these, this is the direction things are going in if all of our payments data is kind of flowing through the government. Um, and Trump came out uh, after talking with Vivek about CBDCs, Trump came out strongly opposed to CBDCs, saying that there will never be one under his administration. And so I see that as a first step towards coming out and saying, hey, Bitcoin, good. We don't need to ban Bitcoin. He doesn't need to endorse Bitcoin. I'm not asking for, <laughs> I'm not asking for any political candidates to come out and say, you know, <laughs> you should buy Bitcoin. Like, it's a great investment. No, but what I do want them to come out and say is that, hey, like, Bitcoin should not be discriminated against, right? We shouldn't have a bias against it. It should just be part of people's consumer choice of, hey, if you want to pay with Bitcoin, that's cool. If you want to pay with dollars, that's cool too. Let's have a level playing field so that consumers can choose which currency they prefer for their payments, uh, which payment network they prefer. You know, if you want to use Visa, that's great. If you want to use Lightning, that's great as well. Um, we shouldn't be forced to use Visa, uh, which is what uh, seemingly a lot of, uh, anti-Bitcoin people uh, want us to do or forced to use a CBDC, right? Um, so that was a very positive development. Um, hopefully it helps uh, triangulate things for the Democrats because 
Um, we've seen on tape Elizabeth Warren say that she likes CBDCs and wants one. Uh, now, the Biden administration, I think, is a little more on the fence about CBDC. I think some within the Biden administration want one, and they agree with Elizabeth Warren. Others are more pragmatic of, um, we don't need one because we can already do everything that a CBDC can do, which is an interesting take, meaning that they already have a totalitarian surveillance system, so uh, they don't need to add a second one uh, is kind of the moderate position. Uh, so uh, they're not, I, I think they're not wrong, actually. I think it's very believable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so their perspective is that the CBDC does not solve any problems, <laughs> uh, which is scary. Yeah. Which is scary. Uh, and, and we saw it in Canada is that, um, you know, there, there were protests against mandatory COVID vaccinations benefit of hindsight. I think the protesters were right. The, the vaccinations weren't all that beneficial. There was no need to like require, a healthy 25 year old male to get vaccinated. I think mandates are just a hard word to, to, to swallow. You know what I mean? A mandate, you know, yeah. making you do something. If you're, if you're going to require a vaccine, you're, the science better be rock solid. Like that there it should just be unquestionable that like, yeah, you are an idiot if you don't get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think they were there with the science. And so I think they were kind of power tripping of like, well, we don't know. <laughs> In fact, I think they were scrambling. I mean, you know, people were waiting yeah. for a full year, two years to get a vaccine to stop an epidemic. And finally, they, they come up with one. So they want to make it, you know, pushed out to the public. That's what I think happened. I, I, I think you're right. Uh, and the, uh, that 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 was not aligned with what a lot of other folks were, were thinking, <laughs> including the protesters. But uh, it's good to see that people still have their own autonomy, though. It is. It is. And they're um, willing to, you know, take risks from work, even, you know, losing yeah. their job to exercise that autonomy. And losing their bank accounts in some cases. Really? So this is happened in Canada? Yeah. Wow. Uh, or they got locked out of their bank account uh, because the, they went to a protest against uh, these vaccine mandates. That's, I mean, one of the biggest selling points for Bitcoin right there. How do you get locked out of something that you're the only one who knows the private key to? Exactly. Exactly. And... And Canada did that with the traditional financial system. They didn't need a CBDC to lock people out of their bank account. So in a sense, we're already there. Uh, the CBDC would just pile on more, more authoritarianism. Um, so we'll see how that shakes out. I think that um, at the very least, it puts CBDCs on the map as a political issue in this presidential campaign, which is interesting. Um, and it kind of pushes now in the in the general election. We'll see. Maybe it'll come up at a debate. Uh, you know, if, if Trump says he's anti CBDC, that puts Biden in a position of having to take a side. Um, and I think if uh, I think the smart move for Biden would be to say that, no, I, I'm anti CBDC as well. It's un American. And just leave it at that. Uh, there's yeah, no this could be a, easily a bipartisan issue. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, we don't have to disagree on everything. Right. We can disagree on some things. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if that, that picks up steam. Um, because he is under pressure from the Elizabeth Warrens of the world to endorse the CBDC. Uh, so, they, you know, there's pressure on both sides. If you look at, I think if you look at the polling data of what voters think, uh, voters are mostly anti-CBDC. There isn't a natural con con constituency of central bankers, right? That that's a very small percentage of voters who are like, "Yeah, I love the Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> They've done great." <laughs> yeah, uh, it's it's very remote, even to folks who don't have anything against it. It's kind of yeah, but Amer American politics doesn't have a great track record of listening to the constituents, do they? No, no, not all, not all the time. Uh, and then even if they do listen to the constituents. And they do say good things, make good promises on the campaign trail. Doesn't translate. Not always. Yeah. Not 100%. So we'll see. Um, let's see. The, uh, there, there was another new item, which is the, uh, there was a big cold front that came in, swept through uh, North America, uh, including Texas. Uh, we got hit with the small tail end of it. And for us, like 20 degrees Fahrenheit is cold. I know that our neighbors to the north uh, kind of roll their eyes at that. I, I, I hate that argument. Look, man, I was born and raised in Texas. I don't know anything other than just a normal 65-degree winter. <laughs> when it gets down to 20 and 17 and 16 degrees, that is cold. That's killer for a lot of people in Texas. Yeah, we're, we're in survival mode at that point. 
Um, it's, Thankfully, we didn't have nearly the ice that we did in, in the Winter Storm Yuri. Yes, very, very, very small amount of ice. Uh, so enough to make the roads, you know, dangerous, but not enough to take down power lines uh, and kind of cause grid disturbances. Um, it did cause a lot of demand uh, for electricity. And so this was really interesting to see, which was that um, in, in the mornings, ERCOT was expecting more demand than there ended up being. And then in the evening, one evening in particular, there ended up being more demand than they were expecting. And so um, it really, I think uh, grid operators have a really tough job when forecasts are unpredictable, right? And so they're they're trying to forecast to their best of their abilities, but ultimately what people end up doing is, is, is hard to, to know ahead of time. Um, and they're kind of gathering data in real time because in response to Yuri, one theory would be that a lot of folks changed their heating from electric to gas because they were worried about the electricity going out again. And thus, there's less demand for electricity, and so the electricity doesn't go out. Uh, so it's kind of uh, an interesting thing there, which, because we've had tremendous uh, population growth since Yuri. Um, so there still was electricity demand growth uh, relative to what has been seen in past years. But it just didn't rise to a level that um, caused tremendous grid stress. Um, so uh, thank God uh, we got uh, through that winter period. Uh, well, we're not out of the woods this just storm. yet. Yeah. Yes, I mean Texas. Our winters last throughout February. So it, yeah, and Yuri was in February. So right, February is colder generally. But, yeah. So yeah. so we'll we'll still see how how it plays out. On a personal note. I was one of those people who didn't want to spend the money on the electricity because I knew that, you know, if we're going down to 16, 17 degrees at night, I need to have some sort of, you know, heat source other than just the central heating. So I drove my, you know, truck down to my hometown and picked up a tire truckload of firewood and I had that going for three days straight. So I don't know how you dealt with it. I mean, did you, did you hike up your electricity bill? Uh, yes, I also I do have a uh, uh, a natural gas fake fireplace. Yeah, I'm familiar. Yeah, and it's funny because uh, first of all, when when we designed our our, our little cottage home, uh, we uh, did not we hesitated on getting a fireplace at all, and the the builder didn't sell us on it. He was like, "It's Texas, like you don't really need a fireplace. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be on for one week." It's nice, like just yeah. staring at the fire brings out the caveman, you know, genetic instinct, whatever you want. It's really mesmerizing to just have it a is. fire near your, you know, home, right? <laughs> or yeah. in your home. And uh, when we finished building the house and we were doing the tour of the house, I looked at the fireplace and it had that insert that's mm -hmm. for you know, kind of the fake natural gas. And I was like, "Oh, I I wanted a wood." fireplace like let's get this replaced and the builder was like well that's on you like you can replace it if you want to but this is what we're installing um i didn't replace it uh because then i was i was uh you know just uh had other priorities um but what i realized is that it's super convenient you flip a switch and it turns on you don't have to get the wood you don't have to tend the fire you don't have ashes and it's yeah, clean, right? It's very clean. All the things I've had to deal with over the last you week. You don't have any smoke coming into the house? Oh, it's yeah. My allergies were, were suffering from the smoke. And, I mean, having to shovel ashes every morning to, you know, making sure that the garage was full with wood that I had already brought. So, yeah, it was, it was a pain. I mean, not a pain, but it's another consideration. The natural gas is nice. We're going in a tangent here, though. I think what people want to hear about is how did the winter storm affect uh, our operations at Riot? <laughs> um well, uh, so I uh, I think I, I'll get I'll, 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 I think our audience is interested in our personal lives uh, first of all, <laughs> uh, and and second of all, how did things uh, think uh, uh, develop it right? So, um, in in a previous winter storm, uh, Building G's dry coolers uh, did uh, have pipes that burst from freezing. Um, so, uh, in response to that, we learned a lot, and so uh, one of our uh, mitigations, our risk management protocols was to add glycol, uh, antifreeze to uh, the uh, dry coolers. Um, so um, I think that kind of that weatherization process uh, helps reduce the risk uh, going into a freeze like this so that uh, we're not damaging equipment. Um, and it also, I think, speaks to how early we are in the Bitcoin mining industry. 
that nobody's done this before at an uh, in industrial scale. And so while other industries um, have dealt with winter storms for decades um, and have developed kind of the right uh, protocols and processes in place, although, I mean, caveat with, uh, let's look at what happened in URI, right? The, you know, the natural gas industry and uh, the whole electricity industry, they were caught flat-footed as and had a lot of learnings from that yeah, and weatherized. I, I a lot. think we can attribute that to this, you know, genuine, general, genuinely, is climate change. I mean, we had the perfect storm happen with Yuri, but that's also to say that you know this doesn't happen in Texas very often in decades. You know, so it's just something that we're we're learning and we're adapting to. That's right. Um, I, I I don't uh, I I I wouldn't go so far as to attribute it to climate change. Okay, uh, that's a difference of opinion. Think, yeah, difference of opinion there. Uh, because I mean, uh, it has happened in the past, right? right. It's just it happened so long ago that right. um, folks either were not born, uh, and so they didn't have it in there. <laughs> Guilty, thanks. Uh, <laughs> myself included. <laughs> you know, uh, but um, I also think that. Um, Things happen, and then we have to learn from them. Uh, and, and so we 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 uh, did, and so we added the glycol. Uh, we also um, had kind of a very rigorous kind of monitoring process. Operational procedures changed up a little bit just to prevent that happening again. Yeah, that's right. And and so uh, I, I I think that um, we're in a much better position. We did not have any equipment uh, damage from this winter storm. Uh, and so, um, knock on wood, that will continue through the season, and uh, everything we learned from past winter storms will help us prevent uh, that from happening again. Um, and those dry coolers are back up and operational. Building G is, you know, uh, is, is good to go. Uh, so, you know, we'll uh, continue to learn things. I'm sure things will come up in the future as well. Uh, so, um, I we will have also. Uh, guests come onto the podcast. We'll talk more about glycol. Um, I think that there's uh, interesting uh, questions around, you know, what percentage of glycol do you put in there uh, and, and all that. And how, um, Okay, so that was good. Uh, I hope everyone stayed warm. Uh, we'll continue to stay warm. Uh, today it's 70 degrees uh, in, here in Austin, uh, but then tomorrow it'll be back to yeah. freezing. It's so. bizarre. Texas has just got a mind of its own. Yes, it we, does. We go from 16, 17 degrees the de night two nights ago to now today it's 70. What I will say is that the climate is changing. There we that, go. <laughs> that's how I'll word it. Uh, whether it's climate change or not, I don't know, but the climate is changing. There you go. Uh, we need to have a climate change scientist come on uh, the podcast to get into what the evidence is. Yeah, I wanted to um, kind of change gears real yeah. quick. Last week, we saw each other out in Corsicana. Did you kind of want to describe what you saw out there? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we we did a, a site visit as part of – we also did an uh, kind of off-site meetings uh, with uh, kind of the leadership team at Riot, and um, that, that I think was a tremendously productive set of meetings. And then visiting Corsicana was fascinating because uh, this, this has just never been done before. Um, it's not just the, the phase one of building 400 megawatts, which I, I understand is very important. The site was prepared for more than just phase one. So all the civil engineering work, you know, that's done f with this vision for a one gigawatt site. Um, and um, we're seeing the first part of building one uh, being built, or of uh, building A, I guess. is Yeah, A1. A1. Yeah, yeah, A1. A1. Isn't that a sauce? It is. Oh wow! You just woke up a memory in my brain. Now, now we've got some marketing ideas here. <laughs> a one sauce. A one sauce. Yes. All right. We, so we, we might have to fight a trademark claim on that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, yeah. So the structure was finally, um, you know, put in place or starting to be put starting. In place. Yeah. Yeah. So they, you know, they pour a base level of concrete for all the um, subterranean kind of infrastructure, then a slab level of concrete. That was already dried, and they'd already put up the first, um, you know, structural components to put up the walls and the roof. And part of the walls were already constructed as well. So metal is going up in Corsicana, which is just insane to me. I remember the day that we went out there to go ribbon cut, or you know, the day that we announced that we were purchasing it. Yeah. Um, well, since then, lots of dirt has been moved. Yeah, I don't want to put a number, but it's over a million 
um, cubic yards of dirt. Yeah. It's, it's, it's insane. I mean, the amount of work that's gone into it is impressive, to say the least, and especially in the time frame. It is. Uh, and uh, it's just it's, it's wonderful to s- start seeing the building come together and also to see that um, the, the, all the puzzle pieces are there. Right. Right. So uh, we are hiring lots of folks in Corsicana. Uh, again, go to LinkedIn. Uh, if you're interested in getting your foot in the door and, uh, you know, construction of an industrial scale data center of a Bitcoin mining facility, uh, there's lots of work to be done because the, the pieces are there uh, and we're hiring the manpower. And we already have a lot of the manpower to put them together, but we're hiring more. Uh, so that's that's a great opportunity if you're in the Corsicana area or the greater DFW area, if you don't mind commuting. Yeah. And again, it's it's positions from every department, whatever you can imagine. There's, you know, a department for that at Riot at Corsicana. So, yeah. And and we're already starting to train the people who are going to be maintaining the mining rigs uh, there. Right. So, yeah, uh, it's just it's it's super exciting to to see. Um, the other part that um, I think doesn't get a lot of attention but is uh, crazy to see firsthand as well is the pond. Now, we call it a pond, but this borders on a lake. Yeah, it's, it's edging up towards the lake size, yeah. Yeah. It'll be cool, it, really cool. It, it can hold massive amount of water. Um, so for those who are worried about us using water, uh, we're going to have a, a retention pond there that's going to help us uh, really reduce our uh, net water use, you know, from kind of the... Uh, uh, the community surrounding, yeah. Yeah, the community surrounding. Um, and, and so... Um, the engineering that. that has to go into all of the design work that, that will capture all of the runoff from that area and then just, you know, redirect that into a retention pond. I mean, for one, it's, it's a genius idea of, like, how do we prevent, you know, a community from being upset at us over some water usage? It's like, well, we'll just build our own retention pond and make it to where we're using the own, you know, our own water that comes off of our own, you know, roofing structure. Like, all of that runoff goes into the retention pond. And, and already, uh, because it had recently rained when we visited. There was already water in there. There was already water in there, and I could see the water going in there, so, yeah. you know, from the, the drainage Those huge system. drainage pipes that were, that were you know, collecting the drainage water were going into the, to the, yeah. to the lake, the pond. Yeah. It's impressive. It's, uh, yeah, turn, turning a, a challenge into an opportunity. So, yep. um, it's... It, and, you know, I think the, the other thing is that um, all of that work, um, it took two years and it's only basically this quarter or this this first half of 2024 that we're really going to see the results in terms of uh turning on um hash rate and energizing miners so uh it's just it takes a massive amount of kind of front-loaded work and over a very long period of time to have the infrastructure in place to be able to capitalize on on an opportunity like the bull market that we're entering here Crazy exciting stuff. Yes. Um, yes. I And I was thinking the other day, I was like, oh, I wish I lived closer to Corsicana so I could like visit it more often. I was, I was missing Corsicana. I know. I mean, for me particularly, I, I want to be out there as often as I can so I can catch the footage of this, you know, amazing facility come together. For me, because I was there when buildings F, G, D, and E were being built in Rockdale, and I was able to be out there every day capturing footage and i'd like to have that amount of um you know footage from corsicana the th- issue for me is how fast they're going i can't get out there as often and as fast as they are moving so we're gonna have to figure out a way for you know that to be rectified yeah, yeah. so i think on that note uh first of all i want to thank uh everyone out in Corsicana, uh, who's uh, out there building uh, w- with a sense of uh, urgency and attention to details. So thank you all for being a part of the right team. And I also want to thank the ops team in Rockdale uh, that uh, was out there in the freezing cold, uh, keeping an eye on things and, um, you know, tuning things so that uh, we made it through that storm uh, unharmed and uh so thanks to all. I hope you get some hot cocoa, some hot coffee. Uh, and to our audience, uh, thank you for tuning in. We'll see you again next week. Uh, we appreciate your time. And um, if you have uh, any feedback, feel free to send it on over. Uh, leave a five-star review 
on uh, iTunes and uh, make sure that you subscribe and share uh, with your friends and family uh, who are interested in Bitcoin, Bitcoin mining. And don't forget to share our LinkedIn for those uh, college students who are interested in starting their career. Excellent internship opportunity. Uh, there's no better place to intern, right? If you get an internship offer from Riot Platforms and from, I don't, you know, Goldman Sachs, the White House, I don't care. <laughs> you pick Riot Platforms, right? Like that is the premier place to intern. Uh, and then you can brag about it to your friends. But most importantly, you can really accelerate and grow your professional career uh, here. So thanks all. And uh, we'll see you next week.